Welcome to the Thyroid Fixer Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Amy, and we're diving deep into the world of hormones, especially for all you fierce women in perimenopause and menopause, and everyone struggling with hypothyroidism. So if you are battling weight gain, you're feeling like shedding those pounds is an impossible feat. If you're dealing with plummeting energy levels, gut-wrenching fatigue, or a libido that seems to have left town, then you're in the right place. And let's not even start on the hair loss. If these symptoms are sounding all too familiar, you have found your tribe. My goal is to educate, empower, and shake up your world. Remember, I want you to embrace every inch of that badass woman that you truly are. So if you're ready to dive in and fix things, let's go. So this is going to be a game changer for you, and you can probably hear the excitement in my voice. The latest introduction, the latest member of the family to the fixer line is Metabolism Fixer. And this, oh my God, I formulated this just for all my people out there that need to lose weight, that need help in the weight loss department, that can't lose weight no matter what they do, that feel like they have a slow metabolism. And that might be thinking of trying all those peptides out there, you know, the Beverly Hills soccer mom drug of choice for weight loss peptides. Or even if you're on them already and you're like, man, these are really expensive and I'm still not losing weight, add in Metabolism Fixer. Here's what I did. I took the power of T2, which increases your basal metabolic rate while you are sitting there watching Netflix. You're burning fat while you're watching Netflix. I combined it with a very unique patented ingredient called Suppressa. Suppressa has multiple clinical trials backing its efficacy in reducing your appetite, decreasing snacking, and providing way more control over your food intake. It is amazing. We also see improved emotional well-being, just decreased food cravings all around, reduced hunger, and weight management. Add on top of that, we have green tea extract, we have purple forest purple tea extract, both of which affect the metabolism in a very positive way without the jitters of normal fat burning supplements out there from the 1980s and 90s, right? The ones that made you feel like you're having a heart attack. You will not have that in any of my supplements, thyroid fixer or metabolism fixer. But metabolism fixer, oh yeah, we kicked it up a notch. It is in powder form. So you can drink it through your day. It's going to flavor your water. We got orange crush and refreshing citrus. I love them both. It is going to keep you under control all day long. So you throw a couple scoops in your water bottle in the morning, throw a scoop or two in your water bottle throughout the day. You will have fat burning and appetite control the entire day for what? An eighth of a price of the peptides? Oh my God, you can't go wrong. So grab some Metabolism Fixer today. Please let me know how you do on it. I am super excited for you. Super excited. This interview is actually from the Better Thyroid and Hormone Club. This is one of our guest experts that comes into the club live and answers your questions, does a teaching, answers your questions live. I decided it was so good that we were going to put it out as a podcast. Now, realize this happens every single month in the Better Thyroid and Hormone Club. So if you want more of this, and if you actually want to be able to participate and ask your questions to my guest experts, then click the link below in the show notes and join the club. But I wanted to bring this to all of you because it was just such a fantastic interview with Danny Hamilton and all of the amazing, amazing tidbits, advice, nuggets, uh, more than nuggets, full meals that you can chew on, no pun intended, regarding insulin resistance, hypoglycemia, how it ties back to hypothyroidism. I mean, ever since that interview, I've even been on the phone with patients saying, okay, well, Danny said this and Danny said this, and this is what I learned from Danny. So this is what you're going to learn from Danny in this absolutely amazing interview. And it's not even an interview. It's her in the group, giving her knowledge freely and answering the group's questions. I absolutely love it. 
So if you love it too, and you want to be a part of this every single month, and you want to get a 10% fix or supplement discount every single month, and you want to be part of a new supplement drop every month, you get a discount when no one else does. And if you want to be part of live lab readings, and if you want to jump in next week for our next expert interview, actually, we have two experts per month come in. And then there's moi giving the lab readings. And then we have a community meeting. Oh my God, we just have so much in there. If you want to be a part of it, then click the link below. Otherwise, just sit back and enjoy this episode and write your own notes because you need to apply what Danny is talking about in order to have metabolic control over your glucose and insulin. My guest for today is Miss Danny Hamilton. She is a blood sugar expert, a dear friend. And like I've shared before, we have been at different conferences together and really started talking. The last one was Dragonfly. And some of the stuff that Danny has said to me about blood sugar is eye-opening. I mean, obviously I see a connection with thyroid problems and insulin resistance and blood sugar, but what you've taught me, Danny, and there's so much more to learn from you, but what you've taught me has been truly eye-opening and really some tidbits that I can even take back to, to my patients to better help them. So first of all, Thank you so much for jumping on today. And second of all, I, I just, I'm, I'm super excited for your knowledge that you're going to share to this group. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Thanks for um, welcoming me, everybody. And excited to be here and answer all your questions. Yeah. Really honored. So first of all, just for anybody that hasn't heard of you, I mean, you've been on the podcast before, but tell people a little bit about your background, how you got into specializing in blood sugar. Yeah. So the quick version of this story is that, you know, I was always a kid who ate lots of processed foods and I had lots of issues as a kid and meaning I was always getting ear infections and strep throat and colds and antibiotics. And then as I got older, I had to get my tonsils out my senior year of high school. I was like a mess. And then the next year I developed really bad seasonal allergies. And looking back, it's because they took out a part of my immune system. So my immune system started going haywire. My diet got worse when I went to college and all that. And I was having all sorts of issues with allergies, asthma, then I moved to Miami, Florida, where season was all year round. And I was like needing to be in a bubble. And I was on so many prescriptions and so many inhalers and I was doing the allergy shots and I was just going broke on copays and I had chronic sinus infections and I had acne. I'm just like, what is happening? I'm in my early twenties falling apart. So I got, by the grace of the universe, this book landed in my hand called The Paleo Diet Solution by Rob Wolf. And it basically taught me all about eating real food and how processed food is causing a lot of issues. And I was like, we've been lied to. I wanted to like shout this from the rooftops and would tell anyone who would listen and sometimes also told the wrong people who didn't care. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. So I was, you know, I, I started doing paleo, eating real food. I dropped the processed foods and like a miracle, every single chronic health issue I had went away. Never got, had issues with candida again, never got a sinus infection again. The tendonitis in my ankle went away and never came back. It was like all these things got better, but then I had a really stressful year and I started to see a lot of new symptoms pop up, a lot of hormonal symptoms. And I was like, oh, is this what happens in your mid twenties? So I started gaining weight. My periods were worse than ever before. My acne was horrible. It, was, it had always come with my cycles and things, but now it was all the time. It was all on my cheeks, all over my forehead. I was like, thank God I have bangs. I was gaining weight rapidly. My periods were like the worst PMS ever. And I'm like, what just happened? Because this diet just healed me. And now it's making me sick. Like I couldn't figure it out. And I was like, how come like, I'm, I feel like I'm doing all the things right. So I looked on Google, found out I probably had polycystic ovarian syndrome. At that time, I didn't get a period for six months. I had the weight gain. I had the acne. I did not have the facial hair or the losing hair from the head. Those are two common other symptoms, which I luckily didn't have, but I had all the markings of PCOS. So I was trying to fix it on my own and everything out there at the time, this is like 2013. It was like, don't have gluten, don't have dairy, don't have refined sugar. I was like, check, check, check. I'm doing paleo. So maybe I'll just paleo harder. And so since nothing changed, nothing changed. So years go by, I'm like managing my symptoms hardly. And I, I was just really struggling. So I decided to go to a doctor and get medications. And he was like, you do have PCOS. You have to lose weight. You have to take the pill and there's no cure. I was like, did I just okay. pay for you to tell me that? Thank you yeah. for that hopeful and helpful message. 
So needless to say, I did not get much help from him. I did go on metformin and spironolactone. They did help me. I should have known that metformin, a diabetes drug, was helpful for me. It should have kind of cued me into the root cause, but I didn't know at the time. And so, and I didn't take the pill. And I was managing my symptoms on the medications, but I just knew, I'm like, I don't want to take these for the rest of my life. This is just you know, I want to get to the root of this. So years later, you know, we try to do it ourselves for so long, right? And so I'm trying to listen to every podcast and read every blog there is. And finally, on a podcast, I hear someone say PCOS is the diabetes of the ovaries. And that sentence forever changed my life because all of a sudden I was like, whoa, hold the phone. I was like, diabetes? What? I'm like, okay, what do I know about diabetes? I'm like, something about blood sugar. That's about it. So, and then I was like, okay, well, what do I know about blood sugar? Um, Absolutely nothing. Because I actively avoided learning about it because I'm like, that shit is boring and complicated and I don't have diabetes, so I don't need to care. And it couldn't have been like further from the truth. 93% of our population is metabolically unhealthy. And that means they're already showing issues with blood sugar stuff, insulin things. And that's where like we can't be avoiding this stuff because it's hard. And that's why I like to make it real easy to understand because I'm not a scientist, you know, I, I don't like, I just want it to be easy enough to understand so that yeah. I know how to heal myself. So after I realized that my blood sugar was a problem, I looked back and I was like, I have to have symptoms. You know, I have to have something that's like, there have to be symptoms here. So I realized that all these like labels and little nicknames I had for myself were actually blood sugar issues. So I, I used to always say, I don't have a sweet tooth. All my teeth are sweet. No, that's yeah. blood sugar issues. Yeah. I used to call myself a breakfast person because I would wake up shaky because I was hypoglycemic, didn't know it. I would wake up shaking and need to eat. And I was just a breakfast person. And I was a foodie because I had to bring snacks with me wherever I went. It was just because I was a foodie. It definitely wasn't because of the hypoglycemia. So, and like, I was a snacker. I was a grazer. Like yep. I, it was like, I always had things after I, like sweets after I ate. And I didn't realize that those were blood sugar symptoms. So there's a lot more symptoms we can talk about. But yeah, so once I realized these were impacting me, they were the hypoglycemia, when I had PCOS, went to the doctor, got my blood sugar taken. And because it was under a hundred, the doctors didn't bat an eye. They didn't bring it up to me. My blood sugar, every time I went like four times that year was 60 or 63, somewhere around there. And I almost passed out. Like I was so dizzy. I was so lightheaded. If I were that at that number right now, I would probably feel fine, but not then. Like I was so, so far from feeling good. Yet I was just like, well, it's because I need to eat breakfast. Like I didn't, it, it, the, I didn't connect any of that. I didn't connect that like, oh, my body should be able to burn its own fuel to keep me stable. So I don't feel like I'm, you know, crashing, like I'm lightheaded. And so the, there were all these things that I didn't know. And then I was able to heal myself, heal my blood sugar. And now I went back to school so I could help other people with it. And here we are. Awesome. I love that. Well, yeah. And same thing for me. I was diagnosed with PCOS, given birth control, didn't take it, took the metformin, you know, connected everything with the insulin resistance. But that was after I was diagnosed with hypothyroidism. So kind of interesting that we were just talking about this before coming on air that you recently stumbled across some information. I'm going to let you take it, but yeah. that is really linking or a strong link at least to hypothyroidism and hypoglycemia. So w what are you finding there? So I work with a lot of people with hypoglycemia and I would need to, you know, go back and look at their numbers, ask questions or look at forward at future students. But they're, they're just saying that link is, it's just a metabolic problem that the, the metabolism. So the thyroid and the idea of the metabolism is that every cell and organ can get the energy it needs to do what it needs to do. That's what metabolism is in a simple to understand way. And mm -hmm. so our thyroid helps that happen. And so if that's happening at a slower rate, and then he also talked about like these mineral deficiencies. So he talked about hyponatremia, are low sodium. I think some people are also low in potassium. I think there's also, there's always a mineral component to this, mm -hmm. that there's low blood volume and low blood pressure. And so it's this constellation 
of symptoms of your body is not getting the energy it needs to do what it needs basically. And so the way the brain is perceiving that is like, oh, we're almost out of energy. And so it's going to send you all those symptoms of dizzy, shaky, lightheaded, brain fog, weakness, fatigue, cravings, because it wants you to get that fast energy. It's not going to be like, hey, why don't you take your time and just go grill up that nice steak? And no, it's going to be like next Starbucks. Here we come. You know, I'm yeah. heading to the drive through like what's in my purse? Like it's that need for that quick energy. So it's urgent hunger. It could be shaking heart palpitations because then you start to get that the sympathetic nervous system starts to become involved because then we're calling on our adrenals to sort of pump us with stress hormones mm -hmm. because our energy is going down. Our body's like, this can't happen. So the adrenals come in. That's also part of why everything is so depleted because this is an expensive process for the adrenals to use all these minerals and nutrients to create new blood sugar and all these stress hormones. It creates the stress hormones, which create the blood sugar. But now the adrenals are in there and you're just burning through these minerals even faster. Like when there's stress, we just burn through our minerals so fast. And then so we just keep staying minerally depleted. And then, you know, the stress is impacting the thyroid the, and, you know, it's impacting the metabolism. So it's this whole cycle of issues. And so if you're someone who experiences this, you know, some of these other symptoms, sweating, nausea, having headaches, I mean, even seizures, you know, that's like sort of the, you know, worst case scenario type of a thing happening here. But this is, I see so many people with these issues where it's like, oh, I can't quite make it to my next meal. So I'm just going to have a little snack. And I was someone who didn't really know that I had these issues because I was just always eating. So I like self-medicated myself out of having these problems, but I definitely couldn't think about missing a meal. These people who would say like, oh my God, I think I forgot to eat lunch. I was like, <laughs> ah, yeah, yeah. I was like, you are either showing off or you're a big fat liar because I could never, like I could never think about missing a meal. Right. So it was just this, I was just so handcuffed. Like that's why my podcast is called Unlock the Sugar Shackles. Like I was so handcuffed to like eating every couple of hours. And that's that classic hypoglycemia stuff that we see. And just another important note is that you don't have to have actual low blood sugar for this to be happening because it, it's more like a metabolic issue. And it's more like the body is struggling to use the fuels it has. It doesn't have any backup fuel. So it's almost like sounding the alarms because there's no metabolic flexibility here that we can't use that stored energy for fuel. So if the blood sugar for some people drops to, let's say a hundred, they start feeling symptomatic. They start, they're like, oh my gosh, I need to eat something. I'm going to pass out. I, it's my blood sugar. And you, you can check in their blood sugar. It maybe it dropped to like 85 or hundred. And in the worst, most extreme case of this, I had a client who told me I have been hypoglycemic since high school. She's now retired. So decades have gone by. And she said, I am hypoglycemic. So we put on a CGM on her. I expected her blood sugar to be dropping to like 50, 60, yeah. something actually low. Her blood sugar, Amy, was spiking to 300 and her lows were at 160 or 170. So this is the perfect example of why we can't also treat this low blood sugar thing. Like, oh, I'm feeling a little like snackish. I'm feeling like, oh, like I'm feeling symptomatic. Let me just have some carbs because what happens? Then we eat the carbs, we spike our insulin. And now, because we're we're probably eating more than three times a day. So now we're spiking our insulin multiple times a day. Every time we snack, every time we put something in our mouth, yep. the insulin takes longer to come down than blood sugar. And so it's just building up in the blood over years and decades. And so now what the insulin does is that creates the insulin resistance, which now is kind of like just turning up that thermostat. So I like to explain it like, let's say I'm in this room, I feel perfectly comfortable temperature wise, and I go into like my sauna and I'm in the sauna for like 30 minutes, I will come back into this room and it will feel freezing in here because I was just in somewhere really hot, right? I'll be like, I need a sweater. I need to bundle up. I need to turn the heat up. That's the same thing that happens. The blood sugar gets so used to being so high. There's so much insulin resistance, lack of metabolic flexibility, which is burning the other fuels. 
So it thinks we can't go any lower than this because it's going to be really bad. Like the homeostasis for that person just got moved up. So if that person went to her doctor and said, I'm having hypoglycemia, the doctor would be like, are you kidding me? You need anxiety meds, my friend. Mm -hmm. So that's where a lot of this comes in because people will test their blood sugar. And if they're using a finger prick, sometimes the blood sugar has gone down and has already come back up. So you're not going to catch it in a low spot. Right. And if you're using a CGM, you might see that it's like, oh, it's only dropping to like 90. And that's where I start to feel really bad. So I ask my clients, like, what's your basement? What's the number that you cannot go below or you start to feel bad? And so that's something that we work on over time that I like to get my client's basement to be back at like a normal spot, like let's say 70, like 70, 65, somewhere around there. I don't want you feeling bad at 85. So then you feel like you need to stay around like a hundred all day to feel good because then your blood sugar is just going to be too high and it's just worsening all these root causes. So that was a lot. And yeah, I'll let you jump in. <laughs> no, no, I love this because this is what we were talking about. And I find it fascinating. Ironically, I have a patient right now who and, and I'm going to ask you about this specifically, is Please. an athlete, an endurance athlete. So I think that there's some cortisol going on with the endurance, long bike rides, craziness. But and minerals. He, and then, oh God, and minerals. Yeah, and we haven't even started yet. This is just like the yeah. text leading up to us working together. Mm -hmm. He keeps documenting. He's like, yeah, but I'm, I'm testing and my blood sugar, the lowest it goes is... 90, 85. He's like, so it's not low, but he feels low. The shaky, yep. the drop, the, yes. the anxiety, the mood, the whole thing. Mm -hmm. But he never gets high. So that's, here's my next question for you is, what about someone who is, we'll say fit, fit, you know, taking care of themselves, probably overdoing it with the endurance. And, and he's not really hitting 300 or 250. Yeah, I see this happen often in people that it doesn't have to be that you're hitting these high numbers, that it's probably the cortisol issues. So this person probably has relatively good insulin sensitivity. That's a possibility. Some people I see that insulin resistance is not the only cause of hypoglycemia. I think for a lot of people, it's actually a hypersensitivity to insulin. So sometimes they're like hyper excretors of insulin. So that keeps their blood sugar kind of normal. I see some people who they start eating and the second they start eating, they start going low. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this is where it's like, they're so sensitive to insulin and there's several causes of this. So there's certain things like hypothyroid is one, Yep. but there's also H pylori, which is a, a, an infection in your stomach could be one high interleukin six. And I don't even know how to test for that. I, maybe it's a, a blood test. This is something I learned, learned from Dr. Brian Walsh. I don't know if you're familiar with him. And then also high LPS. So lipopolysaccharide, which is like this inflammatory stuff that you're, it's almost like bacteria poop. <laughs> like they like let off all this like lipopolysaccharide, which is very inflammatory. Increased gastric emptying can sometimes drive some of this stuff. So and then there's also certain nutrient deficiencies that can cause issues like having hypoglycemia and reactive hypoglycemia. Mm -hmm. So those are surprisingly biotin, which I was surprised to hear about, magnesium, which is sort of one might sort of get that chromium yep. and some other B vitamins as well. And then just salt and potassium. So you have to kind of figure out like, do I need much more salt? And I would always start with like, you know, make some Soleil water. So just dissolve like an inch or two of salt in a big jar of filtered water, let it sit on the counter overnight or for a couple of hours. And then you take like a spoonful of that and put it in your water and see how that tastes to you. So you want to get it to a spot where it tastes salty, but pleasant. Like this is actually very salty because I was just reading about this. I'm like, I think I need more salt. So it's mine is like very salty, but actually still surprisingly pleasant. If it gets to a spot where you're like, I just, I hate the salt. I don't like the way it makes me feel. Most people will be like, oh my God, this salt is like amazing. It feels like I was a dead iPhone and you just plugged me in. And now like you feel like brightened. And that's yeah. what the power of minerals. I mean, minerals are the spark plugs of our metabolism. It's like 
messages jump from one electrolyte to another. So if we don't have a lot of these electrolytes in our blood, the messages are slow to sort of move around. But if we have a lot, it's like, so then the messages go faster. So you have more energy. When I first went keto, I couldn't get my minerals right. And I felt like I was walking through mud. Like my arms were heavy and that was like severe electrolyte depletion. So I felt the very extreme of that. So if I felt like I was moving through, like, I mean, I was like walking in quicksand, like it was so crazy. It was only one day like that, like really intense, but that would be an example of like, the opposite is that you would be able to move quickly and do things and your brain's working fast and we Mm -hmm. need minerals so badly. Our adrenals need them. Our brain needs them. Our thyroid needs them. So really, really important. So that's a really good first step is like trying the salt. If the salt makes you feel bad or worse, you just probably need potassium. So there's a lot of different things, sources of potassium. Coconut water is a source that I don't recommend because First of all, it's very high in deuterium, which is not a topic we'll go into here, uh, which is a heavy form of hydrogen, which slows down your system. It's not biologically appropriate for, you know, you in Iowa in the middle of winter to be drinking something that comes from a coconut. It's really just, it's, it's a mismatch. It's like a big circadian sort of mismatch. So, you know, if doing like cream of tartar or like these electrolyte blends that have potassium in them. That could be better. Seasonal vegetables, lots of vegetables have lots of potassium in them as well. So getting as many fresh foods as you can, especially local from your area would be best case scenario. If aloe vera juice is available in your area, that would be a good thing as well because it is also loaded with potassium, but doesn't have that so much sugar in it that would spike your blood sugar and sort of out, you know, outweigh these, these other benefits. Yeah. 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 Okay. So I'm going back to all the people that I work with because I see a ton yes. of insulin resistance with thyroid. So I'm I'm totally down with what that guy yes. is saying that you're reading about. And many of my patients need to, and my audience needs to lose weight. Like that's one of the big sticking points. So I would say fatigue and weight loss are the top symptoms that my people same really, really struggle with. Right. Yeah. I mean, you same, same here. Thing. That's yeah. so same funny. Thing. It's like, Thyroid is like, is it thyroid? Is it blood sugar? What combination? Like they, they just impact each other so much. I think that there's such a bi-directional relationship with them. And same thing with sleep. It's like, there's that same, like, if you don't sleep well, you're probably going to be tired and overweight. And then again, there's that bi-directional relationship. So it's like, we have to nail in all these things at the same time, because if you just look at one thing, at a time, it's like, we can't let those other things fall by the wayside because they're still impacting it. So yeah, you can. Yeah. I mean, total correlation. Yeah. I mean, those are the big, the big complaints. So before I open this up to questions in the group, can you Mm -hmm. give us the, the lowdown on how insulin resistance or just erratic blood sugar, however you want to call it, how that impacts our ability to lose weight And then my second kind of follow-up question to that is you've mentioned CGMs. How Mm -hmm. do you like to use a CGM? Because sometimes I'll have people that are like, I'm eating low carb. I'm testing, Mm -hmm. you know, my finger with the finger prick. All of Mm -hmm. my numbers are, you know, 80, 90, 100, 120 max. Why Mm -hmm. aren't I losing weight? And I'm like, stick on a CGM because you might find that's something that you're eating that is targeted low carb. Like my biggest blood sugar spike was keto cereal, branded keto, low carb, no sugar cereal. And yes, on the back under the total carbs, it was, you know, what, five, three, whatever it was. And that spiked me to 180. So I'll, I'll hand you over those two questions. That's so funny. My highest spike was also from a cereal. It wasn't keto. It was that Lovebird cereal. I'll say it in yes. this group. I don't oh, like. Oh, I love the Lovebird stuff though. <laughs> it. I know. Well, it yeah. spiked me the highest I've ever seen anything. It was like gluten free, grain free, glyphosate free. It was everything free, but it was not carb free because it's made with cassava flour, which spikes the heck out of your blood sugar. Yeah. Okay. So, how does blood sugar and insulin? impact our energy and weight. So this is a great question. So basically insulin is a hormone that gets released every time we eat sugar, carbs, and even protein. So we get this rise of insulin from the pancreas and insulin kind of takes the glucose by the hand, 
unlocks the doors of the cells and escorts the glucose inside of these cells, like muscle cells, brain cells, heart cells, so that it could be used to make energy. So insulin lowers blood sugar because it's putting it away into our body, right? But insulin is a fat storage hormone. So this process, like, so let's say we spike our blood sugar and we put the insulin takes it and puts it into the muscle cells and we use some of that, but then there's all this leftover sugar. It's also going to store that away as body fat. So if your insulin levels are high, you will be put in a fat storage state. You're in a fat building mode where the body is being told by this hormone, we need to build fat. And as I mentioned in my earlier example, insulin doesn't come down quite as quickly as blood sugar. And so what happens is insulin starts to build up in the blood over years and decades, and it takes about 13 years before we start to see a change in our blood sugar. So once your blood sugar is impacted, your insulin has been increasing for years, over a decade before that. So even if these people are having great numbers on their CGM, even if they're, so let's say they're pricking, let's say they put it on a CGM and they're like, see, Amy, look, my blood sugar is stable. It isn't going over 120. What I would say then is get your fasting insulin checked. And what we might find is that that fasting insulin is too high. You have to ask your doctor for this. Um, maybe, Amy, you can prescribe it, <laughs> get them yep. this lab. But I, de I generally want to see that number, like no one has fully agreed upon the ranges. I will tell you that mainstream says under 20. Yeah. That is way too high. Wait, no. I say ideal would probably be under four, but maybe like I want to see below five is a good starting point. I have clients who once I'm telling you, every everyone who I see at six is symptomatic already. Like they're already showing signs. When I first learned about all the benefits of sunlight and saunas, I was absolutely blown away. First of all, it's the best thing you can do for your body, for detox, for weight loss, for pain and anti-aging. Anti-aging. That's all me. So to me, it's kind of a no-brainer biohacking tool that everyone should have in one form or another. Whether you get an individual portable sauna or a big Mac Daddy five-person sauna, this is a staple, a staple for you to look, feel, and perform at your best. Now, I went with Sunlighten. They are the best company on the market. I have been researching saunas for years. You got to trust me on this one. Years. Sunlighten uses patented heating technology to deliver the highest quantity and quality of infrared on the market. You don't want to go with another company where you're going to get less or lesser quality. Go with Sunlight. And that is my company of choice, my sauna of choice. You will save up to $600 when you use my link and mention Dr. Amy. So you're going to go to get.sunlighten.com backslash Dr. Amy, and you're going to save up to $600 depending on what sauna that you get. So that's G-E-T dot S-U-N-L-I-G-H-T-E-N dot com backslash D-R-A-M-I-E. If you call in, you can also mention my name as well. They got you covered with the discount code. So the other thing the insulin does besides tell our body to start building fat is it blocks the body from burning fat. So it blocks the body from using the stored sugar that's in our liver called glycogen, which if our blood sugar is going down and it's like, oh, I have this meeting, our liver should just give us a little sugar and then we should be right back on track. We nothing, You shouldn't feel a difference at all. But if you have high insulin, you don't get that little shoot of sugar from the liver because your body's trying to build fat. It's trying to store everything. It doesn't want you burning what it's trying to store, right? And same thing with our body fat. We use body fat to power us through periods where we're going longer periods without eating, such as overnight. We rely heavily on fat burning overnight. So if we don't have the liver glycogen available to us, and now we don't have the fat burning available to us, and we're trying to sleep, what's going to happen? Our blood sugar is going to tick down. We're not going to have any of those backup fuels, and we're going to get a spike of 
stress hormones like epinephrine and cortisol. Epinephrine is adrenaline. So then we wake up and we're, our heart is pounding. We're like, I'm having a panic attack. I can't fall back to sleep. Has that happened to anyone in here? Like it also very often happens after drinking because alcohol causes you to be hypoglycemic. So very, very common. So this is why insulin is sort of an issue because it's going to also, if there's resistance to that, because as soon as those insulin levels build up, we start to get, it's almost like a numbing effect to insulin. Like the insulin has the key and it's like the locks get like jammed up. And so now the insulin can't get the sugar into the cells. So our blood sugar can be rising doesn't have to yet, but it, because we might get enough insulin to do this job, but the blood sugar starts rising, but our cells are like, we don't have energy. You're not giving us energy. So you feel tired and you feel hungry because your body is just trying to get energy, but it's not able to get the energy it needs. So that is why high levels of insulin block your body from having energy and they keep you in a fat storage state and they block you from burning your own body fat. So if you have excess body fat and no energy, you can almost be guaranteed that there's insulin resistance happening because that is like the hallmark of it is an energy utilization problem. So in order to get rid of the resistance, so our cell, our cells actually listen to the insulin so the sugar can get where it needs to go we have to lower insulin levels. That's a really important point. I actually just recorded a video today about how to do that. (laughs) It's going to be on my YouTube channel, but intermittent fasting, and I strongly recommend it, including breakfast, do not skip breakfast and do a skip dinner or an early dinner. Instead, this is much better for our circadian rhythms. We also don't want to be running on cortisol all day. So that can work at first, but it often stops working and it plateaus people and it also drives drives leptin resistance. So leptin is another hormone that actually it also often precedes insulin resistance. So leptin is another hormone that tells our body how much fat we have stored on it. And leptin it docks to the hypothalamus which is a little piece of our brain every night around midnight. And so one of the things that blocks this leptin from docking to say like, hey, we have this much energy. So you are good to go to like burn whatever you need. So we we have some excess here. So go ahead and burn it. If the leptin can't dock to the hypothalamus, the things that are blocking that oftentimes are lights in the evening. So having blue light on us, that's why my house is orange and red at night. That's why I wear those blue blocking glasses. Eating too late because we get a rise of insulin and the insulin is going to oppose melatonin. It's going to oppose leptin. So we're getting a lot of leptin resistance and then just overeating all the time. And we can easily overeat like ultra processed food because there isn't that protein satiety like kick in because if you notice most ultra processed foods and snack foods are high in two of the macronutrients fat and carbs which are energy sources but there's nothing that that protein puts the brakes on hunger i personally my my number one blood sugar tip is eat all the protein on your plate first yep. and eat it until you literally can't take another bite. I was just eating, I just made a, a chicken in my, a whole chicken in my instant pot. And I was just eating the chicken. I didn't even look at the amount I ate until I was like, that's enough. And like, you have a, that's enough. And then was I able to eat the butternut squash? Absolutely. There was space for that, <laughs> but there wasn't any more space for the chicken. So we have this natural protein like set point that we need to reach. So you want to eat until you sort of fill that set point. And that's such a satiating macro, the most satiating macronutrient. And it's honest to God stops you from overeating. So it's an amazing tool to like, just fill up on this protein. It helps to stabilize the blood sugar. It's a great way to get this in, but yeah, so leptin could be an issue. So then if the the brain isn't getting the signal of the leptin, it's like, 
it mu- we must be starving. There's no leptin around. Mm-hmm. So it's like, we don't have any fuel to burn. So again, we get a, a double hit of like, you better not touch that body fat. We need to be storing for the winter because it's a freaking famine around here. So all those things and stress, you know, cortisol issues. So like thinking about the timing, um, our good friend, Molly Eastman, she talks a lot. She's a sleep expert. She talks about thought timing. And this is something I find myself struggling with. So you get ladies in here are not the only people who have struggles. I also have my own, but like addiction to this stupid thing, like at night. And I mean, I do have it on red. I do have my blue blockers, but yep. it's stimulating to your, to your brain. And then you see right. something in an email or a text and you get that surge of adrenaline. Like can instead, can we read, you know, I have a friend who does fiction after five. So light topics, easy things, things that aren't going to stress you out because the last thing you want to be doing is having this big rush of stress hormones right before you're trying to go to bed. So all this stuff is so tied in together. So I'll let you jump in. It's so tied in. It's so tied in. Well, la- last comment that I'll make before we open up the questions. Well, question for you and comment. Mm-hmm. I often see, and now it's kind of making sense. Mm-hmm. I will have these patients where we're looking at the blood work and I always order fasting insulin and, you know, the CMP with the glucose, obviously that's kind of, we throw that out the window and then the Mm -hmm. A1C. Now I'll look at the glucose if it's flagged high, but we know, you know, glucose can lie in the morning, whatever. I will see A1Cs of five, 5.1 and over Mm -hmm. here, the insulin 13, 16, 18. And I'm always like, wait, I, okay, you're insulin resistant, but over here, I mean, this is great. And over here, this is bad. And now you explaining it, it totally makes sense. I've never heard that insulin can be high for 13 years before it starts affecting your blood sugar. Yes. So it can go high for decades. And what is happening is that your body in that case where your insulin is, let's say 15, it needs three times as much insulin to do the job of a healthy person, three or three to five times the amount Mm -hmm. of a healthy person, right? So that's where it's like, the body is so freaking brilliant that it's compensating all the time. And it's just trying to keep you alive. It's trying to keep you doing all these things, but you get this buildup of insulin and it's like, all right, here we go. We need a ton of insulin every time. Like it, this is causing a lot of problems because high insulin levels are just so damaging. And then they inevitably are what lead to that final like break in the dam. And now the insulin is just like, we can't keep up. We can't keep up. And so now the blood sugar starts to tick up. It's like the insulin can take that extra load. It's like a single mother who is like, you know, the super mom and she like, she's not skipping a beat, but she is running herself ragged, you know? So it's like, don't let insulin be a single mother and like have to do all these things because eventually it's going to crash. She's going to break. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to crash. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So excellent. Oh my God. This is so, this is so good. I still have more questions if, if we need to, but I want to open it up to the floor here. Okay. Hi. So basically I've been eating carnivore Mm -hmm. and listening to what you're saying. Mm -hmm. And now I'm just, I want to take a little carnivore break, but Mm -hmm. I'm starting back up with Amy again. So what should we be eating? What's going to be the most beneficial? So I would really need to know like what your symptoms are. First, okay. because blood sugar is so personal. Okay. And so that's where, you know, I could tell you, oh, eat all these vegetables. And you're like, well, I don't digest them well. <laughs> you know, so what what symptoms are you struggling with? Definitely lots of sugar cravings. You know, mm-hmm. when you eat carnivore for so long and you know, you how long have you been carnivore? Um, probably about a year. Are you in and, ketosis? You know, I am when I'm truly eating carnivore. And then the holidays rolled around and, you know, I'm surrounded by people eating chocolate and things. Mm -hmm. So I took a little break and I'm noticing, wow, sugar really affects me. Mm -hmm. Really focus on getting it totally out so I can just get away from it, break that sugar craving. Okay. So one of the things that I... I definitely like to teach about because I think it's a big issue is that, and this happened to me with carnivore when I ever tried it, like I've only gotten to five days. I couldn't go past that because I would get so much gluconeogenesis and meaning the, my body was turning 
all that excess protein, which can't be stored, it was turning it to sugar. So it was messing up my blood sugar actually. And it was causing a lot of cravings. And I found that as soon as I got back into ketosis, where my brain was getting this nice alternative fuel source, I didn't have those cravings anymore. So that's one of the things where it's like, if you're doing carnivore, I would see how you do. And, and again, like some people are like, I don't need to be in ketosis and I feel great and all those things. But if you're like, if you're not there and also I just wouldn't assume that when you do carnivore, that you are in ketosis, I always like to test using a blood meter and then kind of finding, you know, I feel best if I'm above, let's say a 0.7 or whatever. So knowing yourself, that's really important. But the other thing is that if you are not a very good fat burner, which I think you may be because you've been doing, you know, okay with carnivore this long, you may be a, a decent fat burner, maybe not. But if you're not a good fat burner, so let's say you've never been in a state of ketosis before, and you're here, you know, working with Amy and you're struggling with your health, chances are you probably have some of that metabolic inflexibility where you can't use the sugar in the liver. You can't burn body fat for fuel. You're not good at using your like dietary fat for fuel. So fats and carbs are two fuel sources. So if we're not good at the fats and then we lower all of our carbs and we're not good, like we're just not in ketosis. This is what I call low carb purgatory. So this is where we're just getting a little bit of fuel. So it's like, that's why a lot of people feel terrible when they go low carb, but they also feel bad when they have the carbs. They're like, I, then I'm just destined not to feel good. And sometimes it's that metabolic switch that's needed that being in ketosis to actually get you to have a good fuel source because now you have all the fat you're eating, you have unlimited fat on your body. So now your body's like, oh, I have like a smorgasbord of food. And so it doesn't send you those same urgent hunger craving signals. So that's often a way that I help my clients get out of that, like having those cravings. And sometimes it's just, it's like you wake the dragon and it's like, oh God. And sometimes it's really helpful to do a stint of ketosis and fasting. And, but I personally also just want to call out that I don't recommend very prolonged keto and carnivore. So I think that it's really important that we honor nature's seasons, right? So if they're, obviously there's, people are metabolically unhealthy. And so if you're severely overweight and have advanced insulin resistance, there's a time to actually like, you know what, even though it's peach season and we live in Georgia, for example, like it's not appropriate right now because you're too sick to handle that. We want to get to a space, this is now like on the other side of healing, where it's like, can we eat more with the season? So that that means where during winter, it's like, it may be more appropriate for us to do something like a carnivore or a ketogenic diet. And then as the seasons start changing and things start, you know, growing in our areas and we get, you know, berries and fruits and apples and leaning into like the squashes that grow in the fall or something like that, it would be great to be able to eat a little bit more seasonally because that's what our body was really designed to do. And so then we can use this idea of cyclical, like a cyclical ketosis, or we can look over the month. And if you're, a, um, if you have a menstrual cycle, you can do, let's say like keto carnivore, the first half of the cycle, maybe stop the day of ovulation. Maybe we get one more week out of that, but then that last week before our menstrual cycles, maybe we want to step out of ketosis. So there's different ways to vary these things. And I think that just like what I did was I did keto and fasting to heal my PCOS. And I just kept going because I'm like, well, this is what I have to do. And there was, it came a point, it was actually two years in and I had tried carb ups and all those things. And they just gave me intense cravings and I couldn't do it. But all of a sudden my body was like, hmm, I would do anything right now for a bite of sweet potato. It wasn't like, you should go get more chocolate. You should get ice cream. It was actually my own body asking me. It wasn't my sugar dragon. And I started to notice my hair thinned a little bit and I would get really cold when I was fasting. And I go, huh, 
I think this is not good for my thyroid right now. So I stepped out of ketosis and I was like, oh, I think I did it just a little bit too long. But now I've added back in carbs and I can tolerate them again because what we want to do is improve our metabolic health so that we can tolerate carbohydrates it, that are, you know, whole natural seasonal foods. So that's sort of that like progression. And, you know, you're nodding your head. So I hope this is making, yeah. <laughs> it seems like it's yeah. making sense to you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. great. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, you're so welcome. All right. There was another question yeah, um, in the chat. So we can control our insulin via our diet and potentially supplements and exercise. Is there anything else we should be doing? Yes. Great question. One of the most important things that I've been getting super into lately, and Amy knows because she saw me when we were away, is my circadian rhythm, circadian rhythm and light exposure. So light is the primary time giver to our body. So what does that mean? Inside our brain, it's very dark in there, right? It's dark inside our skull. So our brain relies on especially the light coming in through our eyes and hitting our skin to know what time it is. What if I just like fell asleep <laughs> just right here? Like, I, why am I not falling asleep? I'm not falling asleep because my body has cortisol. It has all these hormones running through it. There's certain genes that are on. So we need to know what to do at certain times of the day. Our body is way better at digesting and metabolizing food earlier in the day. When the sun goes down, I like to say insulin clocks out. It's like, because our body is not designed because we evolved like cave people outside, right? So we evolved outside. There was unlimited light during the day and it was pitch black at night. And our bodies evolved with that very intense light dark cycle. And our modern environment is destroying that light dark cycle because in the morning we get up and we turn on our phone and all this blue light comes into our eyes. So our body's like, oh my God, it's 1 p.m. And then we go downstairs and we have coffee. Food is the second biggest time giver. So we're jacking up our cortisol, especially if we have coffee before food. So then it's like, oh my God, okay, it's 2 p.m. Here we go. So then you just jacked up your cortisol, but then you're, let's say, inside. You're inside all day. And I mean, I'm sitting in front of the brightest window in my house, but most of us are not in a very bright environment. We're in a fake bright environment. If you took, there's, I have this app on my phone that that's like a light meter. And so if you took the, a light meter and measured inside, and then you went outside, you'll see that even with the lights on our daytime light on the inside is way too dim. But then at nighttime, it's also way too bright. So we're like dampening down each one. We're not getting that bright, bright exposure that we actually need during the day to tell us like, make these hormones, do these things, like use up this energy. We're not getting that signal. And then in the evening time, we have all the lights on. And most of our lights now, because they've made incandescent bulbs, like those Edison ones, they've made those illegal in the United States, which is just ridiculous. And so now almost all the lights are these blue LED light bulbs that are so high in blue light. And blue light raises cortisol. So it has a direct impact on our metabolism, on our hormones, and on our blood sugar. So as the sun goes down, and we're flipping on these lights, we are causing dysregulation. The other thing that blue light does is when we get that rise of cortisol from the blue light, it opposes melatonin. So then we don't sleep as well. So some simple and inexpensive strategies to, for this. And this is, you know, a lot of people are like, well, I saw the red light thing, but I can't get my husband on board or whatever it is. It's like, well, make the house livable. Don't yeah. live in pitch black. Like it's, this is not little house on the prairie. Like we have to, you know, get this modernized, <laughs> you know, we have to modernize this. So I would invest in a couple of orange light bulbs. You can do some Himalayan salt lamps. You can do even those Edison bulbs, you can do some of those, but making sure that they're sort of dim. So we don't want the, any sort of bright light at night at all. Think about what did our ancestors have to look at? We looked at a fire, which was pretty bright and it was on the ground. So that's where the light was coming from. So that's why I like side lamps, no overhead lights. So we had a fire, it was kind of orange, a little bright. And then towards the end of the night, it burned out and we had these glowing red embers, very dark, very red. 
So we want to mimic what early humans saw, right? So we get the orange lights, we get the uh, Himalayan salt lamps, and then an hour before bed, what I have in my bedroom, I have two table lamps. One of the lamps has just a regular old white light bulb in it in case I need it. The other one has a red light bulb in it. So then I turn on the red light bulb in the evening time, an hour before bed, and that does not impact your melatonin whatsoever. Blue light counteracts your melatonin. So the other thing is I would invest in a good pair of blue blocking glasses. I would get the orange framed ones. Mm -hmm. Like people are like, oh, I have them in my regular glasses. It does not work with clear. If you want during the day to get some of those harsh lights, like if you work under like fluorescent lighting or have like harsh lighting during the day, the yellow frames are really good. The yellow lens ones are great. After sunset and actually before sunrise, I would use orange lenses. And then in the evening time, very right before bed, possibly the red ones, but I can't use the red ones in my house because my house is too dark. <laughs> and so like you, you crash into stuff. All right. Aubrey says, what can I do about horrible sugar cravings in the middle of the night? Middle of the night, I would be, that's probably from a blood sugar crash because why else would you be feeling hungry like that? So I would consider, I don't know where you're at in your journey, but perhaps working your way to a spot where you are um, in nutritional ketosis, getting better at burning fat for fuel, using a continuous glucose monitor, things like that to help you understand and to see what's going on. One thing that you can do temporary, I would also look at minerals. So your adrenals probably need a lot of work. And I would also look maybe at like castor oil packs for your liver. So these are all things that I do with my clients in my program. So this is like, I would honestly walk you through what I do with my blood sugar mastery students. We'd have to work on all the things. We'd have to work on diet, get into a state of fat burning, minerals, liver support, adrenal support, stress reduction, do the stuff with the lights. Like, and yeah, so it could be tricky, but if you want to try something as like a training wheels or like crutches, because I'm not like, hey, you have to get all these things right. And it can take like two months to feel better. One thing that you can try is exogenous ketones, like HVMN, the ketone IQ. You can try those right before bed because that can give you that alternative fuel source to run off of overnight. So then that helps a lot of people with their, with cravings and with the, the wake ups. The other thing is you can also try like MCT oil. So again, that, that converts to some ketones and it's like a fat source to help your body potentially do that. And, um, and it doesn't have an impact on insulin. So that is okay. But the idea of like eating, needing to eat before bed, that's something we definitely want to get away from in the long term, like long term goal, because eating before bed is not good for our ability to detox our brain, super important, and then also our insulin and all that st and our sleep. All right. Very cool. And I don't want to keep you over time. So we're going to try to blow I'm, through a couple of these. Okay, good. I'll be shorter. <laughs> no, no, you're good. You're yeah. good. Uh, these mm -hmm. are all great questions. So so it yeah. sounds, oh, well, no. Regina says, does blood sugar or low thyroid cause acne? That was my cause of acne was my yeah. blood sugar. It was high insulin levels mm -hmm. and, and blood sugar spikes cause acne. They also like blood sugar issues clog up the liver. And the liver is, you know, it's one of the major organs of blood sugar regulation. And the liver also, if that gets backed up, it's going to push stuff out because it can't detox fast enough. It's going to push stuff out through your largest organ, organ. of, you know, external organ. Your muscles yeah. are your largest organ. Oh, yeah. that's true. Your muscles are, but then, yeah, we always hear largest organ is your skin, but right. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. you get it. <laughs> yeah. Same thing. And and for me with my PCOS, I never had high androgens. I was breaking out like I was 15 years old from the high insulin. So even with the Thanks. PCA, you know, we always think acne equals high testosterone, high androgen levels. Mm -hmm. And that's not the case. It could just be high insulin. Yeah. So yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Colleen Amazing. is saying so it sounds like it's bad for your cortisol levels to drink coffee on an empty stomach. Yeah. My <laughs> reward to myself for eating breakfast is my coffee. So it's a simple switch that you can make. I recommend eating breakfast within an hour of waking up. 
and then have your coffee afterwards. It's much easier on your cortisol. It's like, think about having this big cortisol hit and you have no nutrients in your body and it's draining your minerals anyway. So coffee depletes your minerals. So if you wake up and have a good salty, salty mineral drink, I like Quinton minerals, 40,000 volts. I have a bunch of minerals. I have so many, I have so many like favorite products that I use. So feel free to message me or um, I'm sure Amy works with a bunch of good companies as well, but getting some uh, good salty, salty drink in the morning, starting with that, having your breakfast and then having your coffee is like an amazing order of operations to do things. So yeah. And that'll help your leptin levels as well. How long does it have to be? Because if I eat and then, you know, I want to, oh, as, soon as, have, so, as soon as yeah. you eat, you can, yeah, as soon as you coffee. eat, you don't need to wait. Yeah. 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 You just want to have the food in your stomach because think about it, like it's also going to like blunt that absorption a little bit. So even putting, you know, putting cream in your coffee is helping as well. I still wouldn't do that first, even if you have something in your coffee, it's not like straight black. It's just easier on your system. It's a little bit of a slower rise because if we think about how our cortisol is supposed to rise in the morning, it's supposed to rise from looking at the sunrise, which is a very gradual rise of that blue light. That's what's happening. And that causes a very gradual rise in cortisol. So when I see these people who have this like big giant spike of blood sugar in the morning, it's like, mm, I, I'm sort of cued into like, is there something in their environment or, you know, their, their life that's like this chronic stressor? Are we stuck in this, like me, like, being busy and rushing, like rushing woman syndrome, amazing yeah. book, you know, like, are we just like, Oh, go, go, go. I have all these things, you know, can we make morning sacred and be like, can I just step outside, see the sun, get my feet on the earth when you ground as well. It's so powerful because food isn't the only way we can get energy. We can get a lot of energy, which are electrons from the earth, from the sun hitting our skin. So being in nature is so, 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 so powerful. And it doesn't matter what the weather is, as long as you can get outside, if the best you can do is crack a window, you crack a window. But if you can get outside, it doesn't matter if it's cold, whatever, it's it's really helpful. Excellent. And that kind of ties in Susan's question too, about she's not eating until 1230 or one. And basically from what you're saying, nope, you got to change that up because of the cortisol yes. connection, the whole thing. Yes. And I think yes. when you start eating... You know, I, I get it where people are like, I'm not hungry. Yeah, but you can take a couple of bites of a, of a you know, protein pudding or mm -hmm. have a hard boiled mm -hmm. egg or a little yogurt. Or a little like bit that. of a protein shake. Yeah. Yeah. So if obviously if you're used to eating at one o'clock, your body is used to that. So you're not going to be hungry in the morning. So I'm not going to say like, oh, just eat your just tomorrow, wake up and eat this big giant meal right when you wake up. No. So move it to 1230, move it to 12, move it to like, you can do that. You can move it like this, or you can do what Amy suggests, just a couple of bites, get your system used to it. And also then you have to look at when's the last time I'm eating in the day, like at night. So can I pull that a little bit earlier? Can I make that meal a little bit smaller so that I'm set up to be hungrier the next day? Mm -hmm. Also that could indicate low stomach acid. So if you're not fully digesting your meal from the night before, you're not going to be hungry when you wake up. So I see that happening a lot as well. And that not eating until like one, it drives leptin resistance. And I see this for women, especially it causes people to hold on to weight. And usually people are so proud of that. They're like, I don't, I don't even eat till one. Like I'm not even that hungry. And it's like, because your hormones are so out of balance, but they're also going to prevent you from from losing weight. So it's like, I, and I'm telling you, it looks like this group is all women guys have it so much easier when it comes to so much more flexibility when it comes to fasting. And even if we are postmenopausal as women, we are just more delicate and we are also like so busy and we're, we're doing so much and we're like people pleasing and we're oh, like highly performing. And we just, you know, we need to tell our body like, Hey, it's safe. There's food around. So I want everyone to feel that it's like you're you're loving your body by nourishing it right when you wake up and sort of reframing it in that way. So 
Oh yeah. yeah. Silent acid reflux. I would say, Oh girl, I'm going to work with you on your digestion. <laughs> I know. Um, I was oh, just good, you're not, I'm like, not you taking... need betting. Like you don't need meds. <laughs> yeah. So I would recommend that you work with Amy to increase your stomach acid. If you take betaine right away and you get heartburn the first time you take it, it doesn't mean you don't need it. It means that you need to heal this tissue first. So I recommend gastrozyme by biotics research. Um, and then that will help to heal and soothe this upper GI tissue. So you can also start with just like a digestive L-glutamine won't do it. That's more for the lower intestine. Like that's more for the small intestine, which is still good, but that is just for small intestine. So it doesn't help really the stomach or the pancreas or the bile. So when we look at digestion, this is another thing I, I work a lot on with people because it's like, I'm telling them to eat all this fat and protein. And if they can't digest it well, it's going to be a problem. So I would maybe start with a digestive enzyme to start breaking things down a little bit better. Um, and then and then adding in if you need the gastrozyme before you take that betaine, but then working with Amy to help you get on the right dose of betaine to increase your stomach acid because usually heartburn is from low stomach acid, not high. All right, excellent. And last question before we go, this is the big, big, big one. Can you address Manjaro, Ozempic, all the GLPs out there to help control insulin yeah. and blood sugar? So I actually did a whole podcast with Nat on these, which nice. um, is coming out soon. Our friend, Natalie Nidham. Yep. But so these can be helpful for people with high blood sugar, not low blood sugar. If you struggle with lows or the feeling of lows, I do not recommend these at all. I think they are very helpful, of course, but if you are not also doing all the things, you will be stuck with taking them. And if, as when you get off of them, you won't, the results won't stick. So there is no magic pill. So if we think about it, like, okay, this is a tool, another tool in the toolbox. It's not our only tool. Like if we, if it's a hammer, we don't only have nails like to, to hit, like we might need a screwdriver. We might need something to sand. We might need a tape measure. We need all the tools. So I would just say, I, I think that Manjaro, which is trisepatide is actually better than Ozempic. So I would recommend like you look into trisepatide more, but I would also try all these things with like the timing of the food and the getting outside and timing of the fasting and the light stuff. Like this stuff is powerful for our hormones. And so if we're always putting ourselves in this situation, in this environment that is directly negating our ability to heal, then we're not going to heal. So, and I mean, we could even go even further into like all the EMFs and all this stuff, but it's like, I can't, I can't even get there yet. You know, I'm yeah, using yeah. my laptop and my so wifi. Much. It's like, it's too much. It's too much. So just saying that to be like, take, try one thing at a time, be like, I'm going to see sunrise. So I'm going to look it up. I'm going to ask Alexa, when does the sunrise be out there for sunrise and start seeing sunrise? Like you probably the person who doesn't eat until 1230. So Susan, you are probably not going to feel hungry or like really feel hungry for breakfast for at least three weeks. So when I was switching, I used to eat, I used to ha wake up, have coffee, and then not eat until like 10 o'clock. That was my typical routine. And when I wanted to switch that, because I learned all this stuff about like leptin and circadian rhythms, it took me about three weeks of just like forcing myself to have breakfast until I actually got hungry. And now what I notice is I might even wake up and be like, oh God, I'm not even close to hungry. This is going to be terrible. And I go outside and I look at the sky and inevitably within like five minutes, boop, I got hungry. I'm like, oh, it worked. And then I go inside and I make breakfast. So it's give it, give these things time, anything with like the light, the circadian rhythm stuff. Our bodies are so used to the schedule that we currently have. We are in training the schedule we currently have. So if we want something different, just give your body like a month, be like, I'm going to do this one thing for a month and then see what happens. So give it a little bit of time because these aren't like quick fixes, like, oh, I took a pill and now I feel different. So that's my last two cents. <laughs> well, that, those are amazing two cents and 10 cents and 20 cents that you've given <laughs> Today, Danny, I love you to death. This has been incredible. Absolutely incredible. I can't uh, thank you thank enough you. for your time, for your knowledge. 
I mean, teaching me things that, like I said, I didn't even know I learned some things today. So yeah, yeah, this has been absolutely amazing. And I hope everyone takes from this, changes their life. All these tips that these experts give can really move the needle. I mean, everything that you talked about today, they can implement right now and and move the needle. So yeah. thank you. From the uh, bottom of my heart, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, my pleasure. And um, I, if you guys wanted to follow me on Instagram and say hi or ask if there's any other questions that come to your mind, I answer all my DMs. <laughs> so yep. feel free to reach out to me, Danielle Hamilton Health on Instagram or you know, if you need my email, you can you can email me to Danny at DannyLHamiltonHealth.com. So yeah, stay in touch if you have any other questions about all this stuff. Happy to happy to answer. And your podcast Thanks, is again Unlock the Sugar Shackles. Definitely. So make sure you subscribe to her podcast as well. All right, thank guys. You. Have a great day and thank you again. Bye. Bye-bye.